They say you can hear it before you see it. Cruising over the deep Siberian wilderness is a terror that defies imagination. Its six rotor blades powered by 24 turbofans generate an inhuman sound as it prepares to launch its six nuclear-tipped surface-to-air missiles. With mobility, range, and the ability to deploy anywhere, even in the sky, the vast territory of the USSR is finally safe from Western intruders. And for the situation where offensive abilities are required, the platform can even be swapped to carry troops, supplies, or even a basing platform for several VTOL Yak-38 fighter jets, making this 20th century helicopter a real-life helicarrier. I present to you in this week's episode the most insane, never-built helicopter, the Yakolev VVP-6 Mobile SAM Sight. The USSR had a big problem in the 1960s, and when I say big, I mean bigger than any other country in the world. Because their territory was so vast, they required a way to keep their borders secure. And considering that during that time the US was infiltrating their aerospace consistently with U-2 spy planes, the Soviets needed a way to stop these pesky western sticky beaks. But the issue with fixed air bases or other conventional solutions, like surface-to-air missile bases, was that they couldn't be everywhere at once. Helicopter designs had the flexibility to fly long range at a moment's notice and land anywhere, but the Soviet Union didn't have a helicopter platform big enough to fill this solution. Thus, the government turned to its various aviation ministries to come up with a solution. Enter Project GDP-6. Started by the Yukolev Bureau, Project GDP-6 proposed the construction of a heavy, multi-rotor helicopter designed to carry special payloads. And boy, do we have to talk about just how insane this aircraft was that they came up with, if you can even call it that. Its official name, like all things USSR, was simply called the VVP-6, and it would have had a very basic elongated shape 49 meters long and 6 meters wide. In the nose was the cockpit, either piloted by two crew members or computerized depending on the role of the aircraft, such as missile launching, and it would have a square fuselage throughout and allow it flexibility with its cargo carrying capacity. Now you're probably looking at this and realizing this aircraft wasn't aerodynamic and would fly like a brick. But you bet with six rotors, fuel consumption was the least concern on their minds. While we don't know for sure, we can estimate that its carrying capacity was in the region of 45 to 50 tons, based on the prospective cargo it was pitched with. To do this, it would have been powered by 24 turbofan engines with 12 on each side and four motors each that would in turn activate six contra rotors. In simple terms, they would rotate in different directions to prevent the aircraft being pushed in the wrong direction and fly straight. The six blades of the rotors were deliberately short as to not interfere with the cargo stored on the main tray, which I'll get to in a moment. Its range could be modified by adding more fuel tanks to the bed of the car, and the helicopter could turn depending on the individual speed of each rotor, negating the need for a tail. The landing gear could be stowed and retracted when not in use. Part of the advantage of this design was in fact that the VVP-6 could carry and even use existing surface-to-air missiles, such as the V-750 or Guideline SA-2 missile. It could store six for transport, or a moment's notice, launch them, even while in the air. Although more accurately, it would bunker down in a remote forest location and track the unsuspecting western spy planes on the surface up to a range of 40 kilometers away or to an altitude of 30 kilometers, just shy of 100,000 feet. 
The various systems for launching, such as radar, missile control and rearming, were stored in the front cabin of the helicopter or built into the fuselage. Apparently the design also said it had the ability to store additional missiles, not just the six on the tray, but a casual look makes us confused where exactly they would be stored. But why stop there? The wacky engineers who came up with this concept had even more grand plans for this design. The aircraft was also created to carry more than just rockets, with further variants planned to carry troops into battle, resupply runs, cargo transport around regional areas, and even as a base for VTOL fighter jets. That's right, this bad boy was a real-life Avengers helicarrier with the aspirations that the Mark II versions of this design would be able to accommodate several Yak-38 VTOL fighter aircraft, potentially launching, rearming and refueling these aircraft whilst in flight, which is a bonkers concept. Operationally, the VVP-6 wouldn't operate on its own, but with a team of several taking on the role of missile launchers, others carrying control operators, and some sporting large radars. And if there were some VTOL fighters included in the pack, they would be used to defend the sites as well as run interference against bomber escorts. The program was a big success and had several huge advantages. For one, the VVP-6 could fly anywhere, making it utterly superior to ground-based SAM sites. It's easy to imagine how fast the helicopter could go to a remote position and overtake any surface-to-air missiles that were being carried by traditional machines trawling over the remote landscape. Carrying more rockets and its mobility would render current SAM technology obsolete overnight. Plus, with a bit of tweaking to the design, the aircraft could carry far more than ground-based transports and would have considerable application throughout the USSR from Army to Navy to even the Special Forces. So why was it never built? Just looking at the design, you can already see a huge roadblock, excessive complexity. Using 24 engines to power six rotors was insane. It would have been a record among all the creations of the era and even in world history. The domestic market could not supply that many machines for a full complement of these aircraft carriers and designing it would have been such a huge engineering mountain taking years, if not decades to develop. Plus, I bet the aerospace whizzes in the comments have already seen an issue with missile launching. If a fast-moving plane like the U-2 flew overhead, how would the aircraft rotate the missiles for launch? Because the rockets were so tightly packed on board, it would require the whole fuselage to rotate 180 degrees in order to track the target, which by that time, the enemy might have already escaped. There was also a flaw with the concept of a flying SAM site. It would stick out as a sore thumb for the enemy to target. It would be easy to detect on radar, as if you wouldn't hear it coming with the six blades, and could be shot down with very simple anti-aircraft weapons. Ground-based SAM sites, on the other hand, were much harder to hit and even harder to detect. With the cancellation of the Yak-38 VTOL aircraft and the obvious flaws of using it as a flying SAM site, the program didn't get very further than wind tunnel tests. The original project hypothetically solved the operational task with flying colours, but making it a reality proved to be too much and was considered hopeless. The Bureau didn't get permission to take the design further and it was shelved deep within the Kremlin until well after the fall of the USSR. Had it been built, we might have seen many more applications of heavy lift helicopters used throughout the world. We might have seen the concept turned over to a passenger transport or even a Western counterpart based on the Bell X-22 VTOL concept. But thankfully, that dream of a monster helicopter stalking their prey among the forests of Siberia never came to be. Wow, what an insane concept. Leave a comment down below if you think this was a good project, or a totally bonkers one that should have never been considered. I'd love to know your ideas, and I do read every comment. Special thanks to my Patreons who suggested this topic today. 
If you want to suggest topics like this for the channel, then you can either make a pitch in the Discord, which I'll leave a link down below, or you can subscribe to my Patreon and ask me directly. You will also gain access to videos early, behind the scenes, tutorials, and be listed right here in the credits. Thank you again so much for watching.